Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the 21st Century Work Life Podcast where we talk about how the world of work and our attitudes to work are changing. And this is a very special episode because I have once more on the show the lovely Wayne Termel, who works with the Kevin Akenberry Group, who is the co-author of The Long Distance Leader, which we're going to talk about in a second. And also, of course, who's been in this remote workspace for over 20 years, you said, Wayne? Yeah, frighteningly enough. (laughs) <laughs> and I have to say for uh, listeners who might be interested, you are also the author of the Werewolf PI series with Johnny Licken. Is it Lycan? How Lycan. Do you say? Lycan. <laughs> Johnny Lycan as protagonist. And I read the first one and I really like it. So listeners, if you like werewolves and PIs and a little bit of a um, kind of uh, noir feel, I think, is, uh, then uh, have, have, a, have a read of those. Wow, that's that's quite an introduction. I've got to be good now. I <laughs> I am lovely and I'm all those things. <laughs> and special you're right. and, and multi-talented. Wonderful. That's what we like on the show. That is part of the 21st century work life. We can be all of these things and hopefully nobody bats an eyelid. So you are mainly here today to talk about you, the second edition of The Long Distance Leader. Tell us a bit about the book and when you and Kevin wrote it first. Yeah, we wrote the book in 2018, uh, which was, of course, pre-COVID and the world was getting there, you know, remote work, telecommuting, all the lovely <laughs> phrases we use that are now ancient. <laughs> uh, you know, it was in, it was increasing at about 25 to 30 percent a year. But of course, COVID pushed us over the Rubicon. We were very fortunate in that the book was enough ahead of its time that people found it useful <laughs> and it was there when they needed it, which as an author is incredibly gratifying. And it's in seven languages and all of that good stuff. And of course, the world has changed in the last six years. I mean, not only have so many more people now experienced remote work, but just things have changed. You know, Zoom literally did not exist when we wrote the book. Uh, What is now Microsoft Teams was Mm -hmm. Skype for Business. Technology and our ability and willingness to use it has gone through some changes And I think, you know, to your point about the 21st century workplace, it turns out that when you give people a year and a half, two years to think about what they want to do with their lives, uh, they're going to make some choices Mm -hmm. (laughs) that they might not have made if they were just so busy doing the same old thing every day. And so people's approach to work has changed. Uh, The organization's approach to its people have gone through some metamorphoses, some positive, some less so. And so the world is a little bit different. And so the second edition of the book puts a little more emphasis on hybrid work. And it also just acknowledges some of the things that have factually changed. Yeah. So you were showing me before the new cover has the word hybrid in it, whereas it didn't in the old one. (laughs) So because I remember, um, so Kevin was on the show um, when the book first came out, however many years ago, I I forgot to dig up the the episode number, but I will put the link in the show notes. We are at the age where doing the math does nobody any good. (laughs) Yes. So I remember from the book reading it that and I, that that it did talk about some it, when it came to the um, examples of the Kevin Akenberry group itself it talked about some people who were in the office together and some were not but I can't remember the word hybrid being there whereas now it's um, that's how we're referring to it well that's one of the things that we're talking about that has changed is the terminology the language that we use I think at the time, going back 2017, 2018, uh, it was either blended was the lovely Mm -hmm. word that we used or partially remote. Mm -hmm. 
And now the word that gets thrown around, the buzzword, is hybrid. The problem, of course, is that what people call hybrid work usually isn't. A hybrid, this is me getting geeky for a moment. Yes, yes. For something to be a hybrid from a biological standpoint, it's two things that come together to create a third very different entity. I mean, the example would be a mule. Mm -hmm. which is, yes, it's part donkey and it's part horse. But as an old farm boy, I can tell you, if you've ever met a mule, it is its own distinct thing. It is very different from either a donkey or a horse. And that's what hybrid work should be. It should be this new thing, this new way of looking at work and, and coming together to achieve goals. And instead, what people are calling hybrid work is not so much a strategy as it is a hostage negotiation. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> tell us more. <laughs> I haven't heard it put in that way. <laughs> Allow me to explain. What we call hybrid work is usually a compromise. Yeah. And as with most compromises, it gets the job done kind of, sort of, but it's maybe not optimal. And here's what I mean by it's a hostage negotiation. The company says, we want people back in the office, but now they've tasted freedom and some of them don't want to come back and we need them. So how much can we make them come back to the office before they quit? And the employees are, you know, I'd really like to stay employed, but I've kind of experienced what it's like to have some flexibility. So how much can I not come into the office before they fire me? And what we do is we wind up with these situations where, well, come into the office three days a week and you can work from home too. And that kind of sort of works when it works. Uh, there are some challenges with that approach. And my belief, Kevin's belief, our belief, is that hybrid work should be something different. It's not just this compromise. It should be a mule and not, you know, a platypus, which is kind of evolved into this dead-end thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's what we're talking about, is that hybrid work is more than just what work gets done where. I think it also includes the factor of time. When does that work happen? Uh, and, and it's about making smart decisions about when do we need to be synchronous and when do we not? Hmm. Hmm. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I know. I, there's so many things <laughs> coming. <laughs> there's a lot there. I know there's, there's a lot. There is so, so much because... Um, My wife will tell you I am a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think uh, I'm I'm glad to hear you say the word compromise because um, I don't know if I've told you, but I've been for the last year trying to write this book, which mixes Shakespeare monologues and scenes with concepts of remote work, and I'm having a really <laughs> a real debate with myself because the chapter on hybrid I am so afraid of. Of um of uh, yeah I'm I'm so afraid of how you're gonna it will wind land. up with poor bottom he's got a donkey head <laughs> yes. <and then laughs> well I left I left I left uh, I left bottom uh, I, I was gonna use him for the um, co working one so the mechanicals were gonna be the co working but I had um, uh, the Romeo and Juliet balcony scene where uh, I think I think I think it was. I can't remember which one it was, whether it was Juliet or Romeo, who said, Are thou not hybrid and a compromise? And I'm thinking it's such a, like you say, for me, it's such a compromise between different kinds of things, between the employers and the employees who want to stay home. But I'm also thinking, and I'd like to hear your view about how this is navigated. I think it's a compromise between co-workers as well, because there are those who love being at home, and then there are those who love being in the office. And then we have not just the power dynamics of the employer-employee, but something a lot deeper as well. What do you think around that? I think that if I'm honest, we are going through probably the biggest change in what it means to work and mm -hmm. what it means to be an employee and what it means to run a business. Probably the biggest change since the 1920s 
when the 40 hour work week came in. I mean, a, a lot of things that we consider, this is how you work now, right? Yeah. The idea of the office building and people commuting and the 40 hour work week becoming a standard and all those things really changed what it meant to work and have a job and employers felt like employees were demanding too much and you know there, there was drama and chaos and violence and scariness yeah. and it eventually settled into a norm for the next 60 70 80 years and now we think of the idea of changing the 40 hour work week or the notion of, you know, how will people do their job if they don't come to the office every day? And, and how much of my time do I really owe my employer? All of those questions mm. have now been asked. And, and, you know, COVID pushed us across the Rubicon in a lot of ways. It not only made us face the reality of remote work and a lot of people who never thought they could do it suddenly found themselves doing it. And lo and behold, we were productive and work got done <laughs> and people stayed engaged and, and not everybody to be sure. Uh, but so the foundations of what we believed to be true and what we believed had to be done have shaken a little bit. And so it's a time of great uncertainty. And I think it's going to be for a while. Uh, you know, one of the pro I get lumped in a lot with the remote work zealots, mm -hmm. uh, which is not necessarily true. What I think is if you're going to work remotely, don't make yourself crazy and here's how to do it. Uh, but I think that as a company, as, a, as an employer, it is not unreasonable to, assume, to expect certain things from your employees. If I'm paying you, I have a right to expect certain things in return, right? Time for value is a very old challenge. For employers and how do you do that without getting run over and abused and run into bankruptcy and how do you do that without selling your soul and all of those things so i think we're in that time and when we're in that kind of time it's really important to focus on what you can control i cannot control what every other organization is going to do i cannot control when the next pandemic comes. I cannot control that a bunch of people believe the pandemic was a hoax and it's all part of a global conspiracy. I can control none of that. And I can't and I shouldn't and I there's no sense trying. What I can control, what you can control, what any of us can control is our actions and our thoughts at this moment. And at this moment... We need to think about, if I'm an, uh, an employer, if I own a company, what business am I in? How do I serve my customers? How do I serve them in a way that is profitable and cost effective? And, you know, we live in a capitalist society where profit matters. <laughs> if I am an employee, I like getting paid. So what do I, what are my responsibilities to my employer? I have some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. not everybody who works from home is highly motivated and productive. Not everybody who goes into the office is highly motivated and productive. So as an employer, I need to find the right people. I need to give them the chance to succeed. I need to establish performance metrics and ways of measuring that satisfy my needs as a business owner and as an employer while not crushing the souls of the people that work for us. And I think the bigger, almost the bigger change is on the employees uh, because Everything that we and our parents and most likely our grandparents knew 
about what it means to have a job and what it means to do good work and what it means to have a career is shaking <laughs> at the moment. And so it's up to us to stop and think about where, where are we, what are we trying to achieve, and how is the best way to make this happen. That's what I think is going on. And, and just going back to your very original point of it's not really about where you're working from, that this whole shift and movement and these negotiations and all everything that's going on is part of that bigger realization that how we've got that what we've been doing up till now is not the only way. And I think you're right that in well, what I'm hearing or what I'm interpreting is that we are trying to work out how to do hybrid, which is should be a third way of working. But we're still trying to hang on to old ways of working because we know them. We're also shifting away because we know there's different ways. And actually, there's a lot more going on than just whether people should come back to the office or not. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's a time of uncertainty. And, mm. and you know, for employers, they're, well, how can we create a culture? How do we get people to work and like and trust each other if they don't see each other all the time? How do we know that they're loyal to us and giving their best, which is not unreasonable expectation yeah. from an employer. Yes. And you can't just kind of know that, right? It's funny, I'm staring at my other computer screen on which I'm writing a blog post about the importance of trust. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, yes. and trust in a remote environment, even when you have the best of intentions, there's a lot of white space where you don't really know what's happening, so you look for clues as to what's happening. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get those clues, it leaves a lot of room for doubt and suspicion and unpleasant surprises mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and all of that. But employers are very concerned about things like culture. And one of the things that we have added to the book it, which is actually from another book we did called The Long Distance Team, is this notion of when we define culture, it actually allows you to define what your work environment should look like. Mm -hmm. Culture contains three pillars, the three C's in good consultant alliteration. Um, Communication, collaboration, cohesion. So if you're thinking about what should hybrid look like, if you're thinking about should people work from home, should they come into the office, if you think about those three components, the answer for you and your company becomes clearer. Mm -hmm. How are we going to communicate? Is not just, you know, do we use Teams or do we use Slack or do we use webcams? It's also... What style of communication do you want to use? And how often do you want to communicate with each other? And a lot of that is dictated by the second C, which is collaboration, which at the end of the day is how does the work get done? Who has responsibility for what? What are the handoffs? What are the workflows? What needs to be done synchronously and what does not? Because a lot of hybrid, a lot of the assumptions about hybrid is that it's built on the need for people to be together more often than not. Mm -hmm. Which is why you have people like me on the west coast of the U.S. whose workday starts at 6.30 or 7 in the morning to accommodate the people on the east coast. <laughs> when it doesn't really need to be that way. Unfortunately, um, I'm an early bird, so it's fine. But do I really need to be keeping the same office hours as my peers, given the work that I do? In many ways, probably not. There's, there are times, to be sure. And with a hybrid team, that's where things get really sticky. Because, okay, we want you to come into the office three days a week. But then people complain, I can't get any work done. I'm trying to work and Bob is in my ear and Mary hasn't seen me for a while and it's Alice's birthday and there's cake in the break room and I can't get any work done. Mm -hmm. Well, what work are you trying to get done in that environment? Mm -hmm. 
right? If your job consists of fighting traffic, coming in, putting your coat over your chair, sitting at your keyboard, trying to shut everybody else out, getting up, putting your coat on and going home, there probably isn't a lot of value in you being in the office. Yeah. On the other hand, if I work from home, but I'm constantly on Zoom meetings and I can't get any work done because people want to have that live, interactive, collaborative experience, I'm not maximizing the time at home. So maybe different work needs to be done in different places at different times. Uh, I know organizations, for example, now that have no meetings Fridays because if you got something to do, do it when everybody's in the office. Yeah, you're not going to get as many tasks checked off your list, but that collaborative work is going to get done and man, you can get a lot done on Friday yeah. because you can be left alone to do the work that requires you to be left alone. Intentionality is where this starts to come in. And if you look at how are we going to communicate, how does the work get done? And then the third C is cohesion, which is how do we choose to come together, right? Are we going to interact frequently? Are we going to interact in large groups? Are we going to interact in very small teams? And if you think about how often are we going to interact and what kind of company do we want to be? And are we a professional services firm where everybody has their clients and they just do their own thing? the cohesion and the relationship is going to be very different than an organization where everybody is interdependent on each other. And so, you know, it's arrogant and stupid to say, this is how you should run your company. But if you can answer those questions and have those discussions, the answer to how you should run your company will become clear to you. And one of the challenges about right now, and I will shut up because I realize I have been talking for far too long. <laughs> one of the challenges is that we assume we're going to get it right the first time. And we're probably not. Uh, if you look at return to office, how it's gone. Mm -hmm. I know very few people who can say, yes, the return to office has been smooth and fabulous and everybody's happy. They have found people coming back to the office who didn't need to. They have found that people we thought we could leave, leave to their own devices really need to be here. Um, a really interesting factoid, the people who are most eager to return to the office are young people, the people new in their careers. They need the interaction. They need the mentorship. The people who are most in favor of remote work are middle managers and people in the middle of their careers who have families and lives and don't need to spend all their time in the office. So a lot of assumptions that we made immediately post COVID in a desperate attempt to get back to normal, we need to keep checking those assumptions and seeing what's up because we're in this state of flux right now. And that's uncomfortable and weird. And hopefully the book helps some. I think that that reminder that we are still working it out and uh, unfortunately needs so much experimentation and like you say, checking of assumptions, etc. that I think that's the biggest reminder is that most organizations haven't worked it out. Well, and, and human beings love ambiguity. Oh, we love when <laughs> we don't know the answers to things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we love it. It is very uncomfortable. So... Wayne, what what other, I mean, you've already touched on some of the things that are different. What other things did you choose to change or add to the book? Is there anything else? I mean, the big piece on culture sounds like something and, and, and just paying attention to that. Well, we incorporated a couple of models from the other books in the series just for context. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things we've learned is that the rules, as we went through the rules, the rules haven't really changed. I mean, if you have a hybrid team, if you have a blended team, if you have a compromise where some people yes. are, <laughs> if you have one team member who is not present, you know, who is working somewhere else, by definition, you have a remote team. 
So the rules still apply. And that can be tough because when we come back together, what we're finding on hybrid teams is there are some very specific challenges that occur. And they both stem from the same problem, which is proximity bias. Mm -hmm. Proximity bias is a perfectly natural way that our brain works that we go to communicate, build relationships, and trust the people that we see most often, the people who are physically closer to us. And for leaders, that can create two problems. One is the formation of cliques, where the people in the office kind of form a team, mm -hmm. and to the exclusion of the people who work remotely. And that's problematic on several levels, not the least of which is exclusion is one of the most corrosive things that can happen on a remote team. It cuts engagement, it cuts productivity, it cuts motivation. The second thing for leaders specifically is that there is a tendency to treat the people in the office differently than the people who work remotely. People who work remotely report whether this is true or not, they perceive that their leader gives them less feedback, gives them less positive feedback, and gives them less quality feedback than they got in the office. They also believe that the people who are working in the office are at an advantage for things like being delegated tasks and being included on cool projects and mm -hmm. having a career path. And in some cases, it's explicit. Yes, we've heard Jamie that. Dimon at Citibank said, yeah. uh, you're welcome to work from home, but you are on the job track, not the career track. If you want to be yeah. on the career track, you will get your tail into the office. That is a conscious decision. Uh, we will see in the upcoming years how that shows up in things like retaining <laughs> talent and recruiting talent and doing up. But for now, that is their decision. At least it's explicit. Yeah. A lot of companies have not made it explicit. It just kind of happens that way. Yeah. Hmm. And if you want to be a hybrid company, if you want to be a remote company, you're going to need to address things like succession planning and development plans. And are we intentionally including... I mean, a very simple thing is if you ask somebody to solve a problem and they immediately turn to the person at the next desk, are you stepping in as the leader and saying, hey, have you thought about adding Alice to this? Those are some of the things that I think are, they were alluded to in the previous version of the book, but now we know these are things we need to address. And we know it's more widespread as well. <laughs> and, uh, excellent. Good. Well, Wayne, um, anything else we should tell listeners apart from the fact that, as you were saying before, if you haven't read the book, go and get it. If you've read the book, should we read it again? Should we read the second edition? Uh, I... <laughs> oh, no, don't buy the book and give don't us more money. No, we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the classic thing when you ask it in a restaurant, oh, do you think, is this a good one? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm still waiting for a waiter to say, don't try that, it's terrible. <laughs> If you had something before, like it, don't have a new one. Um, when's the second edition coming back? Is it 17th? The second edition is out September 17th, because these things never die, September 17th, 2024. <laughs> one of the things, as it gets closer to that time, and I don't know when this is going to air, Pilar, around the time, about that time, if you want to reach out to me and you're wondering whether we should have the new book, get the new book or not, we actually will have completed and available by then a book of 25 tips from the updated version which you can just reach out to me and I will send you a copy and you can take a look and decide if this is, you know, something that you need to take a closer look at. Uh, so you can just reach me through either LinkedIn or email me, wayne at kevinikenberry.com, and I will send you the booklet. 
Great. Well, that's a really nice offer. <laughs> really great. And also something I forgot to say that you're, of course, the co-host of the Long Distance Work Life podcast. Long Distance Work Life podcast, uh, of which Pilar has been a guest and will be again. Yay. And of course, co-host with Marisa. With Marissa, <laughs> yes, so indeed. Lovely. It's a great, 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 great show. Right, Wayne, well, thank you very much for stopping by. Congratulations on the second edition. I think it's fantastic you're doing that. So congratulations. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast. We know there are many other shows for you to choose from. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, and you can check out the full show notes over at virtualnotdistant.com slash podcasts. Talking of podcasts, we have another show you can listen to, Management Cafe, which you should also be able to find on all podcast apps. I have been Pilar Ortiz. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.